Behold the Source Wall. Behind it is the single greatest secret of the universe. This is as far as I dare to go. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Seek and Destroy. And uh, I wanted to talk about some DC stuff recently, and I did a Superman Lois trailer reaction like i filmed that about a couple days ago now i think almost a week ago and hopefully that's going up now and uh, we did a toy thing the other day where we unboxed some mcfarland toys and i wanted to get back into the animated stuff uh, by far you know my love for dc obviously stems from the comic books but i think what really brought it all home for me in the 90s and into the 2000s and stuff was uh, growing up with such amazing animation from DC and Warner Brothers uh, revolving around characters like Batman, Superman, Batman Beyond being one of my favorites, uh, the Justice League and Justice League Unlimited cartoons, and then on to the other great stuff that came out, like the Batman, um, you know, who was uh, done by Brandon Vietti, Sam Liu, and a bunch of other very talented people. And I got to, before I left LA, record an interview with Sam Liu and Brandon Vietti, and I shared that up on my Patreon a while back. So I will definitely try to re-upload that here on this channel um, at some point very soon too, because I want to get at least a few more Seek and Destroy episodes out there revolving around DC stuff. And I think moving forward from here on out, I will do a heavy focus with the Seek and Destroy show on the DC animated universe moving forward, especially with a lot of the announcements we got recently, uh, including today where we got, uh, you know, found out that there's going to be more shorts coming out. And I love the shorts. They're so amazing. Uh, going back to the Jonah Hex ones and the earlier ones with Spectre and all that, and then the ones that they're about to make now, I'm very excited about, or probably working on right now, uh, where we're going to get Commandy, the last boy, who's one of my favorite characters. I'm a big Kirby fan. Uh, but then also we're going to get uh, Blue Beetle. And I'm wondering, is that going to be Ted Cord Blue Beetle? Is it going to be Jaime? Is it going to be both of them? Will Booster Gold be in there? Uh, I'm kind of curious to see what short that is as well. So a lot of that information came out today, so make sure you check that stuff out. Um, I'll put a link down below to like an article that talks about it, so you guys can uh, you know check it out and read more about those announcements. Uh, but today what we're going to talk about is... Uh, Batman Soul of the Dragon. Uh, Soul of the Dragon is a new animated film. If you go back and watch, uh, we covered the DC kind of showcase stuff that came out a couple months ago, me and my friend Gene, and we did a bunch of episodes here on the Seek and Destroy show where we talked about each, you know, division of Warner Brothers, like the movies they have coming out, what HBO Max has coming out, what, you know, TV shows they have coming out, and we did one on the animated episodes and uh, and all the animated movies coming out. And one of them we talked about was this film. As you can see in the screenshot behind me, I have the movie paused uh, because I was going back and rewatching it again a second time today to just kind of take some mental notes and uh, kind of process this. Actually, this was one of those animated films that I don't know if I agree with uh, some of the choices that were made in it, um, but I still really enjoyed it. Uh, that was the thing is there was a couple things in there that I don't know, just personal things, you know, they don't. Uh, but just because I have a personal feeling towards stuff if the movie executes things well enough, it doesn't take my enjoyment away from what was made. And I think everyone who worked on this movie, uh, Sam and everyone else included, did a really great job. Everything from, you know, the, the animation style they used, uh, the way they choreographed some of the fights in it, uh, the color palette they used, even the, the clothing and some of the characters were kind of nods to uh, uh, past films, um, you know, which like, like live action films and stuff that some of this pulls inspiration from. Um, but I also found this to be a very big and deep love letter to uh, someone like Denny O'Neill, who created half of the characters in this movie. Uh, you have uh, Ben uh, Turner right there, the bronze tiger back here in the corner. Uh, you have Lady Shiva here, uh, here in the middle there. Um, obviously Batman, who Denny O'Neill did a lot of great Batman stuff, and Richard Dragon. And these were characters that Denny O'Neill uh, put his stamp on and kind of brought into the world of comic books. Um, even O-Sensei, who's in this movie, who kind of trains all of them, um, he's a character that was in a novel that came out that Denny O'Neill wrote and then was brought into um, you know comic books uh, through Denny O'Neill into the Richard Dragon comics and then later with like the question and stuff like that other writers and stuff uh, kept writing Oh Sensei the character and I've always liked this type of a uh, corner of the DC universe and that's I think because I grew up with films starring Bruce Lee um, um, and Rudy Ray Moore who uh, does like uh, you know uh, black exploitation films I guess if you want to call them that or like exploitation films uh, where you have that and you have like uh, there in the 70s there was a big uprising and those kind of movies and you had like a uh, shaft and things like that and then you also had like Bruce Lee like I said uh, who was like a big inspiration on me and someone I really admired growing up and even his son Brandon who played the crow who I was a big fan of and speaking of The Crow, uh, the person who plays Richard Dragon in this movie, who the movie's kind of focused on him. It does have Batman. He does play a part in it. 
And uh, but Richard Dragon is kind of like the main focus in a lot of ways. He's the opening scene, and he kind of you know takes down the villain uh, in a way at the end. So I want to you know preface this by saying there will be some spoilers in this review in this discussion. So if you haven't seen the movie yet and you don't want any spoilers, uh, please you know turn away now and uh, and go back, go watch the movie and come back here for for the rest of this review if you're interested. And if you have thoughts on this movie, whether they're positive or negative, whatever they are, let me know in the comments down below, and we'll continue our conversation as always down there. Um, so this movie, speaking of The Crow, like I said, Mark Dacascos uh, does a voice in this as Richard Dragon. And uh, I love Mark. I've been a fan of his, uh, speaking of martial arts and stuff like that, I've been a fan of his for years. His Actually, he made a movie in the early 90s that uh, opened my eyes to a different art style of fighting style called Capoeira. And he did a movie called Only the Strong. And I've always loved that film. Uh, banana way! banana way banana you know and i'm sure he gets like uh that a lot from people um and i know he's gotten that from me in person because actually in 2009 uh the year before my brain aneurysm rupture um i met mark when i used to work on dancing with the stars and he was on dancing with the stars and i got to meet him in person and tell him what a big fan i was uh, and he was a very nice guy super awesome so when i you know saw that he was going to be richard dragon and then michael jai white was going to play bronze tiger uh, and kelly who uh, was playing lady shiva and then also uh, David uh, Gentoli, who was from Grimm, the show Grimm, playing the voice of Bruce Wayne and Batman. Um, I thought this cast was awesome, just super awesome. And even my friend Erica Luttrell, uh, my best friend, uh, who I, you know, moved, we used to be friends and neighbors. Um, and then when I moved here to um, Florida, you know, it's been a bummer because I, I haven't seen her in like the last year while I lived in L.A. because of all my health issues and stuff. So I didn't get to be there for her wedding and things like that. Um, but uh, but she's my best friend. And uh, and I saw her in the credits as playing uh, Silver St. Cloud, which is uh, Bruce Wayne's love interest at the beginning of this movie. So uh, I was like, oh, awesome. So please, anyone at Warner Animation who's uh, watching this, give like Erica like a, a bigger role in something coming up. Like she's so talented and so amazing. I'm sure you agree. And she did a great job in the scene she had with Bruce as Silver St. Cloud. Uh, kind of setting the tone of Bruce Wayne and what he's like in this world because you got to imagine just because it says Batman on it you're you're not going to get the same Batman every time it's it, Batman is open to interpretation every time and with this being inspired by these 70s type movies um you know it, it's definitely a different version kind of from Bruce he's not unrecognizable but um this is a Bruce who is a, a, we see in a scene in the movie willing to make um to cross a line if he has to in order to save the world and uh, and that was something i you know it it hurts sometimes when you see superman or batman you know cross a line and, and try to kill somebody like it's it hurts you know as someone who's a longtime fan of these characters but again you have to o always open yourself up for new interpretations and i thought this movie didn't derail from who bruce really is and i thought they had a lot of great bruce and batman moments in this movie too um, so like, let's just talk about a couple of them. For example, the, the basic storyline is that you have this group of six people, um, including Judo Master. <laughs> so we have, uh, hold on, I'll get there. We have, uh, we have Bruce, obviously. We have Lady Shiva. Um, we have Richard Dragon and Ben Turner, a.k.a. Uh, Bronze Tiger. We have the four of them and then also Jade. And then also a guy named Rip uh, Jagger, who is uh, the judo master in the DC comic books, for those who don't know. And uh, and these all these characters uh, all, all are basically on an island training. They all come from some kind of pain, and, uh, and they're on this island to deal with that pain. So we obviously know what Bruce's pain is, but we get little glimpses of what everyone else's uh, pains are. And you see them training. And what I really like about this is typically when we get like a Bruce Wayne origin kind of, which this movie is not really that, but you get to see maybe one of the places he trained at. He didn't train alone. And that's always something I always wondered, like, all right, Batman was, you know, in the Batman Begins movie, he was trained by Rachel Ghoul or, you know, Ducard and stuff. But who else trained with him? Was any of those other people in there of significance? You know, who, was there a, a second best student that Bruce Wayne was, you know, always at odds with? And they've done that in animation and stuff before, but I always like those stories so that it helps drive who Bruce is when you see how other people who had similar training as him, how they deal with the training. Um, and, and also how that pushes Bruce maybe in the direction he ends up going in. And I really like that because he meets Lady Shiva in this. Um, Jade says like, oh, there's no way she's willing to take a life, but clearly she is. There's a great fight between uh, Jade and, uh, or not Jade, but uh, Jade kind of provokes the fight. Um, oh, Sensei wants to give the sacred blade to Shiva. 
And uh, Jay doesn't like that. So uh, so he's like, okay, well, who do you think I should give it to? And she says, I don't know, maybe Rip. And he goes, okay, well, Rip's, you know, he's been here longer. So you think tenure gives you the you know authority to have things? And he's like, well, why don't we put them in a match together? So he has Shiva fight Rip Jagger. And uh, and she he tells Shiva, you can only use one finger to defend yourself. And she does, and she beats the crap out of Rip, which is awesome. She even does a move that I think I saw in a Jet Li movie. Um, it was like a remake of a Bruce Lee movie called Fist of Legend. And, uh, and uh, she grabs the guy, she hooks the inside of his mouth, and spins him and slams him onto the ground, uh, uh, slams Rip on the ground. And I thought that was awesome. I was like, hey, that's great. That reminds me of that Jet Li movie uh, that was a remake of a Bruce Lee movie, um, which if you haven't seen Fist of Legend with Jet Li, you really should see that movie. It's awesome. So there was a lot of cool little nods like that. Like I said, the clothing, uh, there'd be some scenes where, uh, you know, Ben Turner would look like he was dressed like he was um, in a movie with Shaft or, you know, or any of those movies. Uh, and then uh, like the other exploitation films. Um, and same with Richard Dragon, sometimes dressed like in an outfit with Bruce Lee, or even people in the background, like uh, Lady Shiva has uh, her own tournament area in Gotham in Chinatown, and uh, and there's a guy in there dressed in the yellow outfit, like straight out of uh, you know Bruce Lee. So I was like, oh, that's cool. Like there's a lot of visual nods throughout this movie that made it really, really fun. And that was the other thing is like it's a Batman story that's fun. That's what I liked about the one of the elements of the Ninja Turtle movie was that there was fun in it, like. Like I said, there's many interpretations of Batman, and it's very easy, in my opinion, to go the dark and brooding route, but to do a version where there's there's the Batman's kind of cool, like a James Bond kind of cool, but he's also like, uh, you know, the story is fun, even if he's not the fun element of it, if the story around him is kind of fun. That's why I always like Brave and the Bold, that cartoon. I thought that was a really well-delivered show where Batman's like the straight man, stoic, and then everything else around him is like really goofy and fun. And like Aquaman is very outrageous, you know? Um, I thought this movie balanced that really well. And it, it balanced the things it was referencing, like the 70s action films, like with martial arts and, and you know, exploitation films. But it also... Um, felt like a contemporary feel to it too especially with lady shiva her fighting styles i felt were a little bit more modern um and like i said i watched the movie twice because i wanted to kind of make sure i was i knew a little bit what i was talking about so i don't know if uh, if i'm right about some of this stuff but this is just what i've perceived and noticed of it um but i, I really liked how they took their time um you know developing these characters and making them each unique but still giving them moments to shine and like i said it's a group of people who are training on an island um, running from something, and Osensei knows that, but he's trying to give them direction. And he tells them, there is something on this island that I'm basically here to protect, and maybe one day one of you will protect it in my place. And I really liked that setup uh, with Jade. I was really bummed that that setup wasn't really paid off, and that Jade was kind of the sacrifice in a way, and, and died so that the villain could, you know, open the doors or open the gate and bring out the snake people uh, from a Naga, which is an actual thing in Buddhism and, and Hinduism and stuff. It's like a demon from another realm and they need human bodies to, they have to transfer into human bodies to exist in our realms. I think they're called, the realm is called Patala or something like that. Um, so uh, it's, it's pretty neat. Like they have all those elements there and they try to root some of this in things that are believed and you know i don't want to say real things but things that are believed and stuff like that and I, I really dug that about this movie and um and like i said the character moments were really great like the scene where bruce all of them are brought into a room and they have to like punch this uh, this rock and uh and that's their mission is they have to or their training is they have to break through the rock and uh or they have to try it that's what he says he goes try to break through the rock and he's like it's breakable you can definitely do it so try to do it and because everyone has in their head that they that they it's a, it's possible kind of they keep going except uh the i think lady shiva is like you know what i tried and she walks away and then jade is like well if she if the the number one student's not going to do it i'm not going to do it and she leaves and then you have all the other characters uh one by one you know stopping punching the rock except bruce even when the sen oh sensei comes up to him and says when you punch this rock it's going to break it'll be pebbles when you punch the pebbles you'll beat them into sand what I'm trying to show you is that if this rock represents evil, no matter how hard you punch it and break it and tear it down, evil will still exist in some form. I understand that message, but I understand that Bruce feels like he still has to try. And so I like that scene. I may not agree with O-Sensei. I mean, yes, what O-Sensei is saying is technically true, but it's, it feels very hopeless. Um, it felt like he was like, you know what, Bruce, you don't have to try. You tried. You did it. You did your best. You don't have to keep punching a rock. It's okay. Evil's a thing, and you just have to accept that there are some things you can't control. 
yes, while that's true on some level, I do like that Bruce kept punching the rock after Osensei left. I thought that was a really good Bruce Wayne moment. It's okay to be stubborn uh, like that sometimes. Uh, and I thought that was a, a good character moment for Bruce in this movie. Um, but uh, but Bruce is actually, they kind of paint him up. Like I said, it's a different interpretation. These other people had more training than Bruce on this island. So Bruce is kind of the less experienced out of all of them. In fact, his his way of dealing with uh, things is that he dressed up as a bat to kind of add an extra layer of himself to bring fear to people because Richard Dragon and Lady Shiva and all of them, they command fear instantly. Even uh, Bronze Tiger, when he said he's like, I became Bronze Tiger to fight a cult called Cobra. And when I went to kill their master, I found out their master was just a kid. And that was a few years ago. Now the kid has grown up and he's gonna he's in charge of this cult and they're going back to our island to open the gate. And we all have to band back together to stop them. Uh, all of them kind of commanded fear just by being themselves. Bruce is hiding in a costume. And I like that that was kind of addressed, that he, and it helps show that he's like, no, this is who I am. I am this costume now. This is the, this is how I deal with my pain. Um, and you all deal with it in your own way, maybe head on, sure, but I'm still doing it head on too, just slightly different. I kind of liked all these elements. I thought it was really well put together. And while though I have some criticisms of the, the moment where Bruce is willing to snap at the end of the story. Uh, oh, sensei, his body gets taken over by the demon from the other side, and he gets into a fight with all four of these people behind us, and uh, they all lose. And so it's just down to Bruce. And Bruce is like, he's like, what do you have that your friends don't have? And Bruce throws all these you know, smoke bombs down and then runs up behind the guy, wraps his cape. He's like, I have a cape. And he wraps the cape around uh, oh, sensei and snaps his neck. And I remember watching it. When I watched it, I was like, okay. I actually paused the movie the first time I watched it, and I go, because I get really upset when it's just like, we don't have a creative way to come up with something to do. Um, and maybe that sounds mean to say, but I just, that's how I feel. You know, it's, maybe it's not true, but that's how I feel where it's like, we're just going to have him kill the person. I was like, oh, come on. Like he's just smoke bombs and a cape. That's what made him like, you know, snap. Uh, he didn't do something like, because the, the arc of Bruce is that he wants to do everything by himself. So I kind of wish he embraced the help of the others and started coordinating with them and maybe together they could have taken down O Sensei. I think that would have been a better role for Bruce where it's like, okay, maybe in this interpretation, he's not the strongest of these four, but can he at least inspire them? Uh, maybe at the end he takes off the mask and says, you know what? I'm tired of hiding. I'm gonna be just like my friends here and, we, and we're gonna come at you now. Um, maybe that could have been an arc thing. Um, I, I don't know. I think I might've preferred something like that than him just snapping the guy's neck, but it didn't matter anyway. I didn't stay mad for long because once I hit play again, the sensei got back up, twisted his head back around, and beat the crap out of Bruce Wayne <laughs> or Batman. So I wasn't too, too mad. But I was still like, oh, I just, I, I'm sure it's not easy doing these movies and trying to do new things. I'm, I'm sure it's not. Uh, so it's like, I, I can't put myself in these, and the talented people that made this movie, I can't put myself in their shoes. I can just speak as a fan and go, oh, that irked me for a second. But then when I saw it was fruitless, I'm like, uh, well, it still happened. But, uh, you know, at least it, the end result wasn't there. Because the end result is that Richard Dragon gets the killing blow because he realizes the power in himself as being a dragon and being a, an opposing force to the snake people of the Naga realm, Patala or whatever. So in the end, it's uh, Bruce throwing the sword to Richard Dragon and him getting the killing blow in. And uh, and it was pretty cool. And you even saw like, a, what was it, the the, the five-inch punch or whatever, or the, the whatever the, from Kung Fu movies, where Richard Dragon goes up to a King Snake and he puts his hand on his stomach and then does that and then like, you know, pretty much kills king snake <laughs> there was a there's it's pretty brutal i mean it's a pg-13 movie i think and there's some swearing in it and uh yeah bronze tiger lady shiva and richard dragon it's pretty clear that they don't mind killing if if it's if they feel like it's evil um but bruce still doesn't take that route until he makes that decision at the end which i was like eh. but it's fine like i said it's a new interpret it's a different interpretation and there's some things that i just as a fan have to let go of and like i said overall that didn't affect my enjoyment of the movie because I still found that I really liked the movie. Um, the only downside is, again, Bruce has a message of, like, things are better together, things like that. At the end, he still makes his sacrifice. The gate has to shut, so it needs a sacrifice. So Bruce goes into the demon realm to be the sacrifice alone. Um, and it's only because only his friends chase after him. So, like, uh, you know, Richard Dragon, all these guys, they chase after Bruce. And they get trapped into the demon realm with them. And the movie ends with Bruce smiling and going, okay, come on, demons, come get some. And I'm like... Uh, all right. Like I, I guess I wanted more of a, 
like Bruce was told early on, you can't do everything on your own, you know, unity, even Richard Dragon was told that by Osensei, like, hey, together you guys will accomplish great things. And they all kind of fought independently in the end. And there wasn't a lot of group effort until they go into the demon realm, but then the movie cuts off so we don't actually see them fight together in the demon realm. And then I also felt like that wasn't a lot of growth for Bruce because he chose to still be the single sacrifice. So again, these are just creative things that I, maybe I'm missing something or maybe someone who, you know, made the movie can, you know, maybe I'm missing something and it can, I can be explained better by either them or fans. So if you guys have different opinions of me, please let me know down below, obviously. Like I love hearing other people's thoughts and other, what other people took from the movie. Um, these are just things I took and I just found myself like a little bit at the end there going, oh, it's not bad. It's, you know, it's an up ending kind of, but I guess there was a part of me that was thinking, well, I would like to see Bruce understand the message of togetherness, maybe go back and, uh, you know, take Silver St. Cloud and, you know, on a date or something again, like try to call her, um, do something um, other than him just be like, all right, well, you know, I guess I'm the weakest of the team and they need a sacrifice. So while you guys are arguing who's going to be the sacrifice, I'm just going to walk in and be the sacrifice. And I was like, oh, that doesn't feel like a Bruce had learned anything throughout this story. Um, he's still doing things on his own and only because his friends don't want to let him do it on his own do they join him but it's not like he rallies them together and says well let's all go in there he still goes in by himself so i, I still had a little bit of an issue with that um but uh, but otherwise awesome movie honestly great love letter to the you know, the 70s and the type of films we were talking about earlier like if you grew up on that kind of stuff or even if you're new to it and you're, you want to get more exposure to that stuff check this out like check watch this movie then go watch some bruce lee movies watch some uh, ruby ray moore movies uh, watch a watch a shaft you know watch uh, foxy brown um you know watch all these movies uh and uh, and and check them out and see kind of what inspired uh, kind of the tone and the and, and the kind of the look and setting of this film which uh honestly the i think the highest praise i can give this movie is a lot of times you just see batman slapped on everything from warner brothers and you're kind of like oh another batman thing really but this was nice because it was a Batman thing that acted as a vehicle for these other characters to get a little bit more spotlight. Now, I grew up a fan of DC, so none of these characters were new to me. Then not a lot of surprises uh, when it came to the story uh, because I kind of figured out some of the things, obviously, along the way. But, uh, like, I knew who Judo Master was, <laughs> so there wasn't a lot of twists and turns for me. Uh, but I felt like this was a great love letter to this corner of the DC universe that Denny O'Neill worked in and a lot of people worked in in the 70s and 80s. Um, and still sometimes to this day, you still get books with some of these characters, but they don't get a ton of love sometimes. And it was really nice to see all of this. And for people out there who think, you know, Lady Shiva isn't that tough or anything like that, I, I don't know, go back and uh, read Nightfall and uh, Night's End with uh, Batman, you know, where he gets his back broken. Uh, Shiva is one of the ladies that he goes to and, uh, and, and gets retraining from after his back heals. Um, so she's a part of his continuity and she's always been tougher than him. Uh, she's one of those people that, uh, Bruce never beat in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I think until Jeff Loeb had her get knocked out by Batman in, uh, Batman Superman, uh, when he did that, cr the, the mashup book with the two of them, um, in like the early 2000s, I think. I think that was the first time I've seen Lady Shiva get taken down by Batman. But before that, but she was also being brainwashed by, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Gorilla Grodd or something. So, uh, or Ultra Humanite or somebody was uh, brainwashing her. So she wasn't really her technically, uh, but but still like she's, she's awesome. And these characters are all awesome. So uh, I thought it was fun. I think it's a great film. And like I said, it's a great love letter in, to Denny O'Neill definitely. And also to these great films that um, inspired the tone and look of this movie and the direction of it. And I think Sam Liu and the cast and everyone who worked on this, like you did an awesome job. And like I said, maybe I disagree with some creative choices, but they're kind of nitpicks and they're not really, they didn't affect my overall enjoyment of this movie. I found myself smiling a lot and I really love the banter between the characters. I think uh, Adams, I think he was the guy who uh, was a Jeremy Adams who wrote the script. Uh, hopefully I'm not making, you know, messing up your name there, um, but uh, great script. Uh, the banter between the characters was great. Pacing was really well done. Fights were really awesome. And uh, besides a couple little things at the end, I got to give this thing some high praise. So I would say out of five stars, I would give this a four and a half. Yeah, I'd say go four and a half. I was going to say four and uh, like a, four, a fourth of a star, but no, four and a half. This earned a four and a half. Um, I think everyone worked really hard on it and I really like it. And I look forward to seeing more of what these, all these talented people do next um, and hopefully more DC stuff for sure. So let me know what your thoughts are down in the comments below. If you liked the movie, if you didn't, whatever your thoughts are, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments and we'll continue our conversation as always down there. Thanks for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. We'll see you in the future. Peace.